Hello, America. This is Robert Evans. I am sitting in a car on top of a mountain like a professional person recording my podcast, which is this podcast, Behind the Bastards. And we've had yet another, I mean, really bad introduction, actually. I'm, I'm, I feel bad about this one. I actually like that ha- one. Oh, you like that one, Sophie? That's yeah. good. Well, do you think but- that only people in America, in the U.S., listen oh, to... Oh, solid point. The oh, podcast, I, Robert? I, if there's non-Americans listening to this podcast, what the hell are they doing? Like, this is... Uh, they, they don't get our freedom, our freedom of speech. That's ours and ours alone, Caitlin. The best um, thing about freedom of speech is limiting it to a small number of people. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, I don't agree, but I see your point. <laughs> Yeah, I firmly disagree with what just happened, and I take back my praise of your introduction. Hello, international listeners. We love you. Yeah, I bet they're from all over the world. Iceland, yes. Canada, yes. Japan, yes. (laughs) Canada's just Alaska's Mexico. Oh, my God. No, Mexico and Canada are both much better countries. Um, I almost spit my Uh, soup on the mic. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was a bad time to um, try to eat soup. Sorry. I, I took a week in rural America to, to clear my head and get some writing done, and it has made me insult our neighbors to the north and south for no reason. <laughs> you um, did that before. Come on. I did. I did. I, did. I love insulting Hi. nations for no reason. Well, my guest today, as, as you just heard from, is Caitlin Durante. Caitlin, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I'm delighted to be here. Now, Caitlin, you are the co-host of the Bechtel cast. It's true. Um, and you you have guested on Behind the Bastards before. We had a long talk about, um, I think, a man both of us consider a dear friend now, uh, Lafayette <laughs> Ron Hubbard. Yes, yes. <laughs> he he just, uh, he's coming to my birthday party soon. Oh, good. You yeah. know, I think he's at all of our birthday parties, mm-hmm. convincing our small children to deliver letters for him on his boat crusade to find gold in the ocean. yes. God, I miss him. I, I know. Well, we're not talking about that today, Caitlin. <laughs> are we? And we're we are not talking, talking about, about the 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 goat testicle doctor either, right? No, we're not <laughs> talking about the goat testicle doctor uh, either. Um, I forgot about her, that fucker. Oh, <laughs> uh, that guy. Yeah, uh, like Alex Jones, but with goat testicles. No, today we're talking about the free birthing community. Caitlin, have you ever heard of the free birthing community? I don't know that I have, Robert. Oh boy, Caitlin. This <laughs> yes. is you're you're gonna you're gonna enjoy this one. Okay. Oh. I mean so I I I God, where to start? I, I wrote a little introduction here and I don't think I'm gonna read it. I think we're just gonna we're just gonna dig into it. Okay. Um yeah, I, I, the the nexus of my introduction was that back in the day, you know, there, there's this one website that's kind of like the Tower of Babel for the internet, the Something Awful forums. It's where 4chan came out of. It's where, like, doxing was very first practiced. It's where a lot of, like, meme culture originated from. Okay. Um, and that the, those forums had a motto, and that motto was, the internet makes you stupid. And it was just at the time, because like ni- the late 90s, early 2000s is when like something awful was really at its most relevant. I was alive. And, uh, yeah, so Back was then. I. And, it w- <laughs> and you, re- it, it, you remember then, Caitlin, when the internet didn't really matter, when like it was just sort of this silly thing and, and people like mainstream TV or news kind of made fun of people who were in, on the internet a lot. Like mm-hmm. it, it wasn't taken very seriously. Right. And so I think that's what the, the motto kind of meant then was just like the internet's dumb. But as the years have gone by and the internet has eaten the world, I've come to believe in those words very literally. Like, the internet does actually make people stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think to the, the free birthing community in particular is a perfect example of how this works. Because thanks to the wonders of the modern internet, and most particularly Facebook, a bunch of otherwise well-meaning, functional human beings have left a trail of dead babies in their wake. <gasps> Not because they wanted to kill babies, but because the internet broke their brains. And that's the story we're going to tell today. Wow. Okay. Are you, are you excited? This is a dead baby episode. <laughs> oh my. Okay. Wait. Okay. Initial question. Mm-hmm. Preliminary question. Sure. Do you know anything? Absolutely. I don't know anything about the free birthing community, but I have a feeling that 
there's got to be some overlap between it and just based on what I think it is based on the name alone, uh, overlap between that community and the anti-vaxxers. Do you oh, know what? absolutely. Okay. Oh. oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, for okay. goddamn sure. Oh, right. my God. A hundred percent. Cool. Got it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool, Caitlin. And I, I want to welcome you, by the way, into a really rarefied circle of, of Bastards Pod guests. Uh, currently, Sophia Alexandria, uh, Billy Wayne Davis are the only two members of the Dead Babies episodes <gasps> sub club. So very... Can we get a couple of air horns in there for uh, uh, for the third member of our dead baby triumvirate? Yes. Absolutely. Pew, pew, pew. I just added so there in we case go. they're there working we go. so much. <laughs> Are you honored, Caitlin? I'm so honored. And what a what a group to be a part of. I mean the mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. I mean Squad Billy Wayne goals. and Sophia. I mean what yeah. what terrific people. So rarefied air. I'm honored. Rarefied air. Now, Caitlin. Uh, if you, if if you, or at least, sorry, not even you, Caitlin. If you, the listener at home, have heard about the free birthing community recently, it's probably because of a fabulous NBC News article by Brandy Zadrozny that dropped a couple of days ago, and the, the article's title was "I Brainwashed Myself with the Internet." Uh, it is the story of a 28-year-old woman on the West Coast, pseudonymed Judith, uh, who found herself slowly drawn into a series of online communities of women who believe that the best way to give birth is with no medicine, no doctor and no midwife. So, you know, we, we are all aware that there's like home birthing, um, sort of like sure. communities and stuff. Mm-hmm. These are people who are like that, but they're like, but midwives are evil too. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I don't want anyone who knows a goddamn thing about medicine around for my birth. Like, <laughs> that's the gist of these people. Huh. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... That's a fun thing that I hadn't realized existed until I read this article. And the, the TLDR of the story is that Judith left her baby in her belly for way too long, more than 42 weeks, um, because these people believe, among other things, that having your labor induced, you know, medically is um, is an, an, an awful thing to do and an unnecessary thing to do. Okay. So she was pregnant almost three weeks past the nine month mark right. and refused to go to the hospital and her baby died inside of her. <gasps> um, yeah. This is <sighs> the first time we've had a first dead baby on page one. We're not even halfway wow. through page one. Yeah. I bring that out and people, you mm-hmm. know, the dead, the, the, the dead babies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I meant by that. <laughs> yeah. It got weird really fast. <laughs> Yes, I it just did. Uh, my presence encourages people to talk about dead babies is I think what I meant. Well, that's good. Well, we'll be talking about a number of them today. So obviously, Judith's story uh, was a traumatic, painful nightmare. Um, and she's far from the only person that this kind of nightmare has happened to as a result of the free birthing community. Uh, the NBC article itself links to a November 2018 Daily Beast article by Emily Sugarman. Uh, the article's title is, She Wanted a Free Birth at Home. When the baby died, the attacks began. And it's, it's the story of a woman named Lisa and her would-be daughter, Journey Moon. Uh, Lisa got drawn into the free birthing community via, like, Facebook groups and podcasts, and the, her baby died. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then she was harassed by a bunch of people online who were angry that she'd killed her baby, who had been infiltrating these free birthing communities. It's a mess of a story. Mm-hmm. And the tales of these two women comprise about 90% of the public discourse around free birthing at the moment. It's kind of very recently burst onto the scene. Okay. But there's so much more more here under the surface uh, than is even in both of these very well-written articles. And today, I, I, I felt like what I could do to add to this is dig a little bit deeper into where the free birthing community comes from. And the individual, I'm going to call them bastards, who are responsible for starting what is effectively a weird cult dedicated to getting people to basically kill their babies by not uh, having anyone who knows anything about medicine around when they come out of people. Okay. It's cool. Fun story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can't mm-hmm. wait. You sound really motivated by this <laughs> to to be a part of this fun tale. I so am. You you have no idea. Just I I have no ability to like emote with my voice, but um, I am very excited to learn about. We this. call that v moding. Mm, okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Now, uh, free birthing obviously has its origins in the natural home birth movement, and the term home birth started being used in the mid 1800s as hospital births became more common. At present, most so-called developed nations, you know, uh, that's the term generally used. I don't like it, but yeah, it's kind of hard to find a uh, counter term sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, have home birthing rates of less than one percent. Um, mm-hmm. It's broadly accurate to say that the end of home birthing as a normal thing you know, the end of that being the way most babies were born, has corresponded with a massive reduction in the rate of both infant and mother deaths in childbirth. So we stopped giving birth at home, started giving birth in hospitals with doctors, and a lot less babies and moms die, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty obvious. Sure. But here's where it gets weird, because the situation isn't quite that simple. The United States today has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the Western world. Six of our infants die for every thousand live births, which puts the U.S. on par with such healthcare powerhouses as Serbia and Malaysia. Uh, despite regular advances in technology matters, uh, matters are actually getting a lot worse for American mothers at a startlingly rapid rate. A pregnant woman in the U.S. today is 50 percent more likely to die in childbirth than her mother was. Huh. Yeah. Like, that's an enormous jump in mama and baby deaths. Right. What um, would account for that? What accounts for that? Well, there's, there's a number of intersecting factors here. Um, one of the ones given regularly is eroding social support for women. Mm-hmm. Um, so as a result of this, like, crusade against uh, birth control and Planned Parenthood by the right in our country, mm-hmm. women's access to obstetric services in rural U.S. counties has collapsed. Nine uh, percent of all rural American women lost hospital obstetric services between 2000 and 2014. Huh. Uh, the shocking expense of birth plays a major role in this, too. People who just can't afford to, to do it in a hospital. Mm-hmm. So between the cost and the sheer lack of access, the fact that growing communities of American women have been turning to home birth is not weird. Um, And it's not necessarily harmful either. The Netherlands actually has a really high rate of home births. In 2009, the largest study of its kind was conducted there, analyzing more than 530,000 births and finding no difference in the birth or death rates of home births versus hospital births. And you'll hear this study cited a lot by home birthing advocates, and they all tend to leave out something critical, which is that the home birthing mothers in this Netherlands study were all women who were determined by a doctor beforehand to have low risk pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So if you have a competent midwife and if a doctor is consulted first to make sure you're a low risk pregnancy, home birthing can be perfectly safe. Sure. That's the one thing I want to get out of the way first. Mm -hmm. But our free birthing friends who we're going to be talking about today, they don't use midwives and they for sure as shit don't consult doctors. Uh-huh. Um, and most of the Facebook groups where these people gather explicitly list advising another person to seek medical attention as a bannable offense. So they'll say like, if you advise anyone to go to a doctor to induce pregnancy, to like talk to an OBGYN or whatever, um, like we'll kick you out of the group because this is not about that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Mm. So these <laughs> these are the people. I feel like these are the people who, like, if they were, uh, you know, convicted of a crime or they had to go to court or something, they'd be like, "I'm going to represent myself. Like, I don't need a lawyer. I'm yeah. I'm going to just do this on my own." Wow. Yeah. Okay. There's that phrase like a person who defends him- themselves in court has a fool for a lawyer. I guess a person who delivers their own baby has a fool, fool for, for a, a doctor. OBGYN yeah. Yeah, or an obst- <laughs> obstetrician. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the first Facebook page that comes up now when you Google free birth Facebook group uh, currently hosts an image meme that says, we are all descendants of someone who birthed at home without a licensed midwife. Um, And that is true, but you could just as easily say we're all descendants of someone who died at home giving birth uh, without any sort of medical assistance Uh because that's equally true. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. We all have a grandma here who got through a couple of babies and then couldn't make it past fifth or sixth or whatever right yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> this is gonna be a fun one that just made me think like who like d- did i have like a great 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 grandmother who like died during childbirth but like their baby survived and like i'm the descendant of absolutely that's got, yeah that's gotta be true for yeah 100 m- percent of us probably a hundred percent of us there's yeah. no one who somewhere in their family line doesn't have multiple people who died during childbirth yeah like that's that's just a guarantee just because of the way the world like, biology and shit worked mm-hmm. and works 
So when we're when we're trying to unravel the mystery of how this deadly free birthing community came to be, because I wanted to kind of trace it back to its origins, uh, and my first question when I started doing that was, when did this whole movement split off from just the home birthing movement? Mm-hmm. Uh, and as best as I can tell, a lot of it traces back to the story of one woman named Catherine Skoll. Now, Miss Skoll was a former Chicago police officer, uh, and she was pregnant with her fifth child. Um, back in 2008. She was admitted to Rush University Medical Center and received an unpleasant surprise. Her normal obstetrician was out of town on vacation. So instead of the doctor she was comfortable with, she was attended to by a stranger, and a stranger who happened to be a really big asshole. Hmm. Uh, According to Miss... Yeah, yeah, he he sucks. This guy's... Dr. Scott Pierce is his name, and he apparently started their interaction by yelling at her for not coming in earlier and not calling before coming in. Hmm. He informed her that because she had not given them enough warning, there was no time for him to give her pain medication. Then he told her that she deserved to be in pain for not giving the hospital more lead time, saying, sometimes pain is the best teacher. Wow. Sounds <laughs> yeah. like a great person. <laughs> not, not a great doctor. Um, he next gave her an extremely rough vaginal exam that like, she <gasps> described as unnecessarily rough and painful oh. while she was in mid-contraction. Um, and then he ordered her to begin pushing before she was fully dilated. Oh my uh, he gosh. told her repeatedly that her baby might die and had a loud phone conversation in the next room about abortion, telling another one of his patients, that stupid woman, she has no business being pregnant. <gasps> so, pretty bad story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not how you want a pregnancy to go. No. <laughs> um, and Catherine Skoll is not the bastard here. She filed a civil suit against Dr. Pierce. Uh, he was eventually fined $500 and sentenced to one year of medical probation, which seems like a, a reasonably fair punishment for his crime. I feel, um, yeah, I would, well, find only $500. Yeah, I think so. the fine could have been higher. The fine should have been higher. But like, I, yeah, he was definitely like when a medical board looked into it, they found out that like, yeah, this guy's behavior was completely unacceptable. Mm-hmm. And it, it the story of, so like Catherine Skoll did nothing wrong. Um, she was abused by a doctor. She f- filed a suit against him and he was punished. You know, we could argue the punishment should have been more, but mm-hmm. her part of the story, she acted perfectly reasonably. Sure. But the story of Catherine Skoll took off like wildfire among the networks of mommy blogs dedicated to the natural birthing movement. Um, and without knowing it, Skoll became a rallying point for other women who had bad experiences with their doctors during childbirth. Skoll's story helped to galvanize a community of birthing extremists who had started organizing online. And one of the very first, and perhaps the founder of the free birthing movement, was an Australian woman named Jeanette Fraser. Jeanette founded the website Joyous Birth in 2007. In December of that year, she coined the term birth rape in a blog entry to refer to what she thought people like Dr. Pierce were doing to their patients. Mm -hmm. Birth rape. Hmm. Yeah. Um, So here's... Here's kind of her explaining what that means. I don't care if you don't like the word or the idea. It's real, so get used to it. Survivors are angry, and we are starting to talk about it. Remember that old anti-violence slogan? Well, it means even in hospitals and even in stupid hospital gowns, when I say no, it means no. When you shove your arm in a woman who's screaming no, that's rape. When you rupture those membranes because you have to tick the box and comply with protocol, even when the woman screams no, that's rape. When you slash a woman's vagina with scissors and she's screaming no, that's rape. And on the streets, it would earn you a jail sentence. Your green gown is not protection. Do that to me, and I will charge you. Don't forget it. We are angry and we are powerful. We have survived your raping protocols so we can survive anything. Be afraid and don't underestimate us. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious kind of for your thoughts on that. I'll I'll tell you sort of where I land on this, which is that I'm sure there are a lot of things that happen to women who are giving birth that they may say no about because once you're giving birth to a baby – the doctor is going to like legally has to do whatever he can or she can do to make sure that baby comes out alive. And you might not in the moment want that, but you're in a hospital and that's kind of the way hospitals go. And I'm, I'm personally like, obviously I'm very pro choice, but at the point in which that baby is coming out, like the doctor is equally beholden to the baby and to the mother. Um, that's kind of how I think. Sure. And I, I, yeah. And I'm, that, I'm interested in, yeah. I mean, the child birth like that's it, it that does like complicate matters because um you know on one hand you have you know 
I kind of see what she's saying um, in this in this definition of this term um, yeah. of you know doctors like you know doing things that could be considered rape or assault um and like you know the the women or you know the people who are giving birth not giving consent but you know the doctor is doing something that they deem medically necessary for you know the safety of the baby perhaps so that is a very complicated thing um I, mm, okay so <laughs> i Okay, well, let's let's do this. Uh, I I don't know if, if if you know this, Robert, or uh, um, if any listeners are aware of a, a podcast that I've been working on called Sludge, an American yeah. healthcare story. So, um, and this is all about a recent experience I had with the um, American healthcare system. Spoiler shit. It's it was shit. So <laughs> I and I'm not saying that every, you know, healthcare experience of every person in the US is shitty. Uh it's not if you have a million dollars or more. So but you know, I uh, so, this is all to say that I have uh, hearing people's stories because I've started to interview other people with their sort of medical nightmare stories and I'm learning all these different things about how certain like medical protocol is not very good. Um, one specific example I will cite is the way that the medical community treats uh, like intersex babies, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which is right. horrible. And they perform procedures and surgeries that the babies can't consent to <laughs> um, and that the parents often don't know uh, enough about the situation, you know, just all these things. So on one hand, like, Yes, uh, they're like having people who know about childbirth and who know about um, the protocol for medical protocol for childbirth should be present um, at a childbirth. But there's also certain things that medical professionals sometimes do that are perhaps violating patients. Yeah, so I have very I, complicated feelings about <laughs> the whole it's, thing. It, 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 it is really complicated. I, I, I don't like calling it rape because, I don't know, rape is a very specific thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand how some of the trauma, you know, of, of undergoing, being forced to undergo a medical procedure you don't uh, want to do undergo um, or don't, you know, are, are, are kind of not present enough mentally to like understand what's happening to you because you're in this like really altered state. Mm -hmm. uh, like I understand how that would be traumatic, um, but I, I feel weird about saying that like if a doctor does something you don't want because he's trying to save your baby's life, um, that that's the same as rape. That That's weird to me. Sure. I do. Yeah. Get, but like there's a bunch of shit, obviously, that like, yeah, doctors do without the consent of the baby, like with intersex babies. And also like you can make an argument about circumcision where it's like that's not a medically necessary thing you're doing. And the mm -hmm. child should maybe have some say in what happens to its own body. Right. Um. So like, yeah, like, like it, this is like this whole issue. Like there. Th I, I, I want to kind of highlight that, like, while this community we're talking about, I think, is fundamentally toxic, there are some reasonable questions that, like, start – that were being asked at the start of this. And I think this woman, Jeanette Frazier, is going too far and mm -hmm. kind of – yeah, we'll talk about her more in a bit. But I don't think, like, they're, she's entirely – and these other people are entirely coming out of an unreasonable place. The, the healthcare system and the childbirthing system in this country is fucked. And, like, the fact that women today are 50 percent likely to die in childbirth mm -hmm. is as much evidence as you need to know about that. Um, I wonder it's if really she, messy. <laughs> I wonder if she just came up with that term birth rape because it sounds sort of like birth rate. And she's like, won't this be a catchy phrase or something? I don't oh. like. <laughs> um, I th I, I, you know what? That might be the case. We'll we'll see if you, how you think about that when we finish talking about Jeanette Frazier. Hey, okay. Robert, but do you you, wanna, Robert, do you want to know what else is a really catchy phrase? Oh, I was going to say, do you want to know what won't? perform medical procedures on your child's genitalia without their consent. Oh, I, but, I think that's our our, our, uh, our sponsors who yep, offer that, products absolutely. and services. <laughs> that is the only guarantee we make about our sponsors, Mike Bloomberg and the Raytheon Corporation. They will not order 
surgery on your children. I can't vouch for Mike Bloomberg on that. No, actually. he will. He will He's absolutely a order. Bastard. Yeah, no. <laughs> Jesus. I, we shouldn't have. And Raytheon will as well. Um, so enjoy these words from our sponsors who may, in fact, uh, order your children to undergo medical <laughs> procedures that are not strictly necessary. Ads. We're back. Okay, so we're talking about this woman, Jeanette Frazier, Mm -hmm. who coins the term birth rape, um, and she has this uh, website, Joyous Birth. And Joyous Birth advocated for uh, legal reform around pregnancy. And and the core ideology on display there is the same core ideology that we saw creep up later in the free birthing community. Um, And the basic idea is that women should be the absolute arbiters of what happens during their pregnancy, which, like, there's aspects of that that sound reasonable, but, like, obviously... I do think there is a certain point where we're like, no, you, you've got two human beings here now, and like, you don't get to make every. I don't know. I, I I have a lot of issues in general with the amount of control parents have over what happens to their kids' bodies. <laughs> sure, that, that worries yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, this is a really messy and complicated thing. Um, but joyous birth was very clearly from the beginning focused around the desire to like not have any medical procedures performed on your children to do it all naturally or holistically with like whatever remedies you could whip up in your kitchen. It had a forum with a few dozen members and that forum had threads with titles like strep question mark, question mark. Can this be treated without antibiotics? (laughs) Hmm. (laughs) Another ear infection dot, dot, dot. What can I do to avoid the antibiotics? (laughs) So not only, so once they're, children uh, have been birthed assuming they survive mm-hmm. there's they're against all medical yeah assistance yeah that's really for the, the feeling rest of you their get. kids life <laughs> okay yeah there's a lot of talk about how can i avoid antibiotics for my children with a- bacterial infections uh <laughs> <laughs> one of the threads from mummy juice just says blood and poo question mark which i'm sure <laughs> does not end with a happy story <laughs> so huh Not a great community. Mm. We we can agree there's some problems with the way uh, childbirthing is handled uh, by the medical establishment. But like, yeah, if you're typing out, my kid keeps getting ear infections. Why? How can I deal with this without treating it with medicine? (laughs) Like maybe Hmm. you're doing a bad job. I don't know. (laughs) Just give that kid some uh, some goat testicles. Yeah, give that kid some fucking goat balls. It's a cure all, as we learned. Or audit the child, uh, get an e meter out, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, it, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, now, I'm, I'm not exactly sure when all these women started using the term free birth to describe what they were advocating, but by March of 2009, that change had happened. Um, mm-hmm. And the first time I run across the word free birthing to refer to this community mm-hmm. uh, is when Jeanette Frazier was interviewed by a website called The Age. Uh, and I'm going to quote from that interview. This is right before she was supposed to give birth to her fifth child. Jeanette Frazier is in labor. Her plan is to drop the baby on the lounge room floor or wherever feels good at the time. Has she called the hospital to let them know what's happening? When you go on a skiing trip, do you call the hospital to say, I'm coming down the mountain. Can you set aside a spot for me in the emergency room? I don't think so, says Frazier, whose breathing sounds strained. (laughs) Amazing logic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they generally do have medical professionals uh, at ski lodges and stuff because of the dangers of skiing. But Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty much where we end the conversation that started with me calling Frazier and asking if it was true that her organization, Joyous Birth, was advocating that women go it alone giving birth at home with no midwife or general practitioner or bags of resuscitation gadgets. Free birthing, plenty of women do it, she says. In fact, Frazier is doing it right now. I prefer to be an autonomous care provider, she says. So uh, that's kind of the terminology used here. Yeah. I mean, um, okay. So I'm obviously all for like giving women agency over their bodies. Right. Right. So, like that's important. And it absolutely like, so it feels like this community, they like started with that, but then have taken it f- far too far. Yeah. To the ex- I mean, and I'm sure you're going to get into this soon, but like all, I mean, 
if we prefaced it, the uh, bit dead babies. Um, oh yeah. So like obviously the results <laughs> aren't uh, often good. It seems with this uh, with free birthing. But like, oh, it just it, it's so annoying w- w- that they're like doing this under the guise of like, yes, women's autonomy and agency and look how important it is but because that is important. But then they've like bastardized it into this like disgusting killing baby enterprise. <laughs> like, Yeah, it's and it's it is frustrating to me that they're kind of co-opting a lot of the language of the pro-choice movement because right. it is like. When that baby's, you know, a clump of cells, when it's it's not capable of living independently in any way, shape, or form, I I, I think it would be horrible to give anyone but the mother control over her own body. But at right. the point that that thing's been in there nine months and it's coming out and it can survive on its own, like this is no longer just you here. There's an, an independent living human being that also has rights. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it is kind of messy drawing that line, but certainly at the point at which you're 41 weeks pregnant, <laughs> like, um, I I think, yeah, I don't know. Especially it's messy. just because like there, I mean, I don't know anything about childbirth, uh, nor will I, because I don't intend to have children ever, but like mm. there are so many people who do intend to have children who still like there's... There's only unless you're trained as a midwife or a medical professional, it yeah. it seems like a really dangerous thing to go at <laughs> alone. Yeah, and as that, yeah, <laughs> and it's like these are people who are kind of like refusing for there to be any kind of like reasonable middle path here because you know the, the the evidence does show that like if you're checked out by a doctor beforehand and you have a midwife, home birthing can be a, a totally safe process. But they're mm-hmm. like, no, fuck that midwife thing and fuck checking with a doctor. That's all a violation of my rights, um, which is. <laughs> Dumb, I think. I think it's it's a dumb way to do things. It's not good. Yeah. So Jeanette is probably the clearest case for the founder of the free birthing movement. And her baby, uh, who she was pregnant with when that article was written, uh, Roizen, was born five days after the article dropped. Jeanette delivered him without assistance in her home, and Roizen was born alive, but not breathing. His heart was not beating properly. He was not stillborn, but he did come out in immediate need of expert resuscitation. And unfortunately, no expert was available, and all Uh Janet's arnica creams and herbal childbirthing remedies were useless in the face of this cold reality. Imagine that. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to quote from the coroner's report about her her dead baby. Mm -hmm. Quote, Essentially, Miss Frazier was quite unprepared for what happened. There was not even a hard, flat surface available on which Roizen could be placed for resuscitation. So these three amateurs, Miss Frazier, Mr. Stokes, and Miss Deuce, first placed the child on the rim of the inflatable pool, and when that proved unsatisfactory, used a chair. They were unable to abandon the chair and place Roizen on the floor in order to effectively administer CPR, because... The placenta not having been delivered, that was as far as she would reach. Evidently, it appeared to nobody present to clamp and cut the cord, and anyway, Miss Deuce told the inquest she had not been aware of the ready availability of any equipment to enable her to do so. According to Miss Deuce, further difficulties were encountered in administering CPR because Roizen was slippery and difficult to hold, and evidently, it did not occur to anybody to wrap her in a towel, though there (laughs) were towels nearby. How? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, fucked up. Wow. So, yeah. in a case like this, mm-hmm. I mean, this is like straight up negligence, right? Where like the yeah, baby, I, I would, I would say so. The baby um, died, and the mom <laughs> was responsible. Like, is she a murderer now? Like, does she face? <laughs> no, like, she le- legally no. And okay. in most parts of the world, she will not legally face consequences for hmm. this. Um, you know, it's kind of a thing. We're we're only just now within a pretty recent period of time where like parents would get start to get in trouble in some places for like refusing to give their kids necessary blood transfusions because of a a religious belief. Like you can still get away with that actually in a number of places. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is, this is not a thing where like the women who do this are generally prosecuted at all. Um, Okay. Although, yeah, I would agree with you. This seems like negligence of maybe a criminal nature. Yeah. It's like manslaughter. Maybe I don't (laughs) like. Yeah. Baby slaughter. Baby slaughter. Ooh, that's yeah. a horrible phrase. <laughs> so that's Jeanette Frazier, one of the founders of the free birthing movement. And the other woman usually given as a founder for the free birthing movement is Laura Shanley. 
She was interviewed in December of 2008, the same month Catherine Skoll filed charges against her doctor. Uh, and she was interviewed for an ABC News article titled, Mothers to Be Saying No to Modern Medicine. Now, that article does not use the term free birthing, which is part of why I think Jeanette Frazier probably gets the credit for that. Mm-hmm. But it does mention a dead baby, hmm. Laura Shanley's dead baby, to be precise. Shanley had successfully delivered her first four children at home. She delivered the fifth, too, but he had a rare heart deformity, and he died. Shanley claims this had nothing at all to do with the fact that she chose to give birth without any expert medical care present. Quote, if you have a baby that's born at home, and especially in an unassisted birth, regardless of the fact that the coroner said this baby would not have survived, you know, there are still people that will blame me for my baby's death, Shanley said. And that's just something I have to accept. Now... I'm not competent to diagnose whether Shanley's child would have died if he'd been born in a hospital, but someone who is competent is Dr. Amy Tutur, an obstetrician gynecologist who runs a blog called The Skeptical OB and focuses mainly on busting misinformation about pregnancy. She has a special hatred for free birthing and notes of Miss Shanley's pregnancy. She made no attempt to stop the premature birth of a son and watched him die in the bathtub. So, Mm. yeah. (sighs) Two founders of the movement... Two dead babies. Hmm. That's where we're starting here. Okay. Cool stuff, huh? Really, really cool stuff. Caitlin's looking at me like, (laughs) Sophie, why did you bring me here? (laughs) How how, how, how you feeling, Caitlin? Um, You know, I I am really just frustrated by the willful negligence of this this movement. I'll buy you soup plantation next time we get dinner. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much. We are... We are... (laughs) Five pages in, uh, Caitlin, and uh-huh. we have four dead babies. So we are uh, almost one dead baby per page of this. Wow. Yeah. What, Pretty cool. What a rate. What a rate. <sighs> so uh, Shanley and Frazier were the two earliest, loudest voices in the splinter of the home birthing movement that turned into free birthing. Uh, they both led large online communities that increasingly pushed their members away from trusting actual medical professionals for anything. Dr. Tutur blames them for a lot of this, and she considers their activism to be the result of extreme emotional immaturity. And she wrote on her blog, quote, free birthers are monstrously egotistical, reflexively defiant of authority, unwilling to admit mistakes, incapable of accepting responsibility for their own actions, and entirely devoid of any empathy for their suffering babies. Yeah, so yeah, sums it up for me. The, I wonder if they're all just like narcissist, like yeah, narcissists. Yeah, who I, like I, um, I don't need a doctor. I'm a genius, and I can handle this on my own. I, I don't think all of the women who get sucked into it are. I think most of them are probably pretty normal people who are kind of maybe more inclined to like sort of hippy dippy stuff and like uh-huh. kind of like off the grid. A lot of like off the grid sort of like you know, back to nature, almost survivalist kind of women get Mm -hmm. really into this because they're attracted to the idea of self-sufficiency. Sure. But I do think the the people at the head of this movement, the women who are sort of like driving it, I think there is a lot of narcissism. Got it. Um, And and you can see that in the things that they say. Um, uh, For example, in the wake of her baby's death, uh, Janet Frazier uh, made this defiant statement. My birth rape with my first child is traumatic. My stillbirth was not. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that just sounds like a lie to justify what she's doing with yeah. pre-birthing. <laughs> and also, like, regardless of what happened with your first child, that baby's alive. <laughs> it gets to right. live a life. Yeah. And um, your other baby is not. And yeah. Note the difference. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So another story that a doctor to tour cites of like kind of narcissism at the heart of a lot of these free birthing people is the case of uh, a woman named Paula, uh, Mm P-A-A-L-A. Her infant son was born extremely early, weighing only one pound, six ounces. He had to spend four months in the NICU and only survived due to intense medical intervention. Paula was forced to give birth in the hospital because something was very clearly wrong with her pregnancy, but she still insisted on giving birth as close to alone as she possibly could. And I'm just going to read what she wrote on her Facebook page for a community of other free birthers because it's it's fucking wild. Mm-hmm. 
I took out my IV lines. Nothing was being pumped into them at that point anyway, and my hospital bracelet. I wanted to take a shower with both arms free of junk. I figured they could put that crap back on me if it was an emergency, but I needed to feel like myself again. Did I mention they tracked and measured everything that came out of my body? Shortly thereafter, she was in active labor with a premature baby. She retreated to the hospital bathroom to decide what to do. Option one, she wrote, call the nurses and either be prodded while birthing right there or be wheeled in for an emergency C-section. Option two, wake my husband and labor with him secretly, but then I know he'd lose his cool and call for help. Option three, labor by myself with my baby, just us, and I'd birth him and catch him and then call for help. Obviously, I went for option three. It seemed like the safest thing for my baby and myself at the time. (laughs) The studies I'd read didn't report benefits for a C-section for babies of his age. That vaginal would have been safer, and I knew he'd get drugged up and controlled by strangers uh, was going to make things dangerous for me. After a couple of painful contractions by the toilet, I laid out a couple of Chuck's pads to catch the blood and crap I was sure was coming. Yeah. (laughs) So... And she she writes like this about like how good it is and how important what she's doing is for the safety of her baby um, and ignores the fact that her baby only survived being born four months prematurely because of intense medical intervention, right. because of doctors and nurses working incredibly hard with advanced equipment to keep the baby alive. Um, she makes it all into a story about how cool it is that she gave birth hiding alone in a bathroom without telling any of the medical professionals around her. Uh, Yeah. So this also... It's messed up. This movement seems, among many things, like a disdain for science. Like, they're just like, science is... Um, not cool. (laughs) But you know what is cool? My baby potentially... Like, I... The, uh, The fact that I'm in control. And not some doctor. Right. Not. <laughs> I mean, it's it's the, like I said, it's the anti-vaxxer thing, right? It's just like, um, how yeah. could this possibly help even though this, like, the, it's just, yeah, the, the ignoring the, the science, the facts behind it all. Wowie. Okay. Yeah. It's pretty cool, Caitlin. It's pretty cool. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Paula gave herself enormous credit for cheating the system and giving birth uh, unassisted while ignoring the hard work of professionals. Uh, her defiant interpretation of a situation she probably made worse was interpreted as a story of self-reliance by her fellow free birthers. Instead of a cautionary tale, it reinforced dangerous ideas in the heads of dozens of women. In the years since Jeanette Fraser's baby died, the free birthing movement has grown, like the alt-right, like the bleach-drinking cult, like QAnon, and like dozens of other toxic subcultures in the fertile substrate provided by Facebook. Like every subculture, it developed its own media ecosystem, with its own popular podcasts and news websites and influencers, all of whom prey upon the ever-growing market of hippy-dippy new mothers-to-be who don't trust Western medicine. And that's how Judith, the subject of that viral NBC article, found out about free birthing. I'm going to quote from that article now. Judith worked at a flower shop. The daily drive was an hour outside of town, time she filled by listening to podcasts. When she got pregnant, she devoured episodes of The Birth Hour and Indie Birth, popular programs on which women shared their childbirth stories, which ranged from hospital to home births. But it was the free birth podcast that really spoke to Judith. Built as a supportive space for people who are learning, exploring, and celebrating their autonomous choices in childbirth, the podcast features Emily Saldaya, 35, a Los Angeles free birth advocate and founder of the Free Birth Society. The group has 46,000 followers on Instagram, and its (gasps) podcast hit a million downloads last month. Yeah, that's too many. My podcast doesn't even get that much, and it's... (laughs) Amazing. Not horrible well, a million propaganda. Downloads, a million downloads in a year. Um, okay. Well, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Bechtelcast but that's beats that. <laughs> too many downloads. Yeah, far, <laughs> too many far too many Instagram followers. <laughs> that's thousands of women potentially endangering their babies, mm-hmm. um, which oh isn't my great. Oh, God. Not great. Not well, ideal. Robert, mm-hmm? do you want to know what will not endanger... You're, I don't. I can't even vouch for this because Bloomberg. But we are. Has, I mean, no, because we're absolutely supported by Mike Bloomberg, who will even, in fact endanger babies. I can't even vouch for this. Okay. Oh, actually, Sophie, I'm glad you brought that up because I have this new ad copy from Mike Bloomberg. Uh, so I'm just going to read that right now. Uh, vote for Mike in 2020. He will endanger your babies. That's the Mike Bloomberg promise. <laughs> he absolutely promises to endanger everyone's baby if elected president. And it is, in fact, the only promise he's willing to make. So, you know, a bold stance by Mike Bloomberg. You got to respect it. Well, yeah. Yeah. 
You heard it here, folks. That is an official Bloomberg 2020 campaign ad. Mike Bloomberg will endanger your babies. No so, NDA required. Mm-hmm. No NDA required. He'll do that for free. <laughs> well, I'm sad. All right. Here's some other ads. We're back. So we're talking about this kind of network of free birthing media circles, primarily podcasts. And this is part of, you know, Caitlin, podcasting has been good to both of us. Mm-hmm. Um, I make a, a, a my living at it and I, I enjoy it. And I, I think I enjoy other people's podcasts that they make, including the Bechtel cast, your podcast. Thank you so much. Um, I worry a lot about podcasts, though. Um, and this is we're getting a little off topic. But like if you read Mein Kampf which everybody ought to. Um, one of the points Adolf Hitler makes is that, like, the, the written word, essentially, newspapers and, and books by philosophers, all that, that, none of that shit convinces large amounts of people of anything. The human voice is what uh, can, can change people's minds in huge numbers and shift the destinies of nations. Like, mm. that's what is it, uh, the, the right voice at the right time. Um, saying the right things can be hypnotizing to large numbers of people. And I, I think that's what happens to um, to this young woman, Judith. She's she's spending two, three hours a day in the car. She lives out in the sticks. She's listening to the podcast to help pass the time. And these women on this free birthing podcast, in the way that podcasting hosts become to us, become sort of like surrogate friends. Mm-hmm. And she trust them. And obviously she trusts these women on this podcast more than she trusts some doctor she's going to meet a couple of times. Sure. Um, and it's probably going to be very short on time. And like, th- this is one of the things that scares me about podcasts. Um, yeah. The, yeah. I, I hadn't even fully, uh, yeah. until you brought that. Yeah. I hadn't fully appreciated uh, the, the power of the voice, the human voice yeah. and how influential it is can be that is scary okay i will <laughs> yeah i'm gonna think on this a bit <laughs> i mean on the lighthearted end of it we can tell people to buy bolt cutters and 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 the like to to break into the mansions of the wealthy when society collapses mm-hmm. but like on the dark side of it all this stuff happens too so it's really a mixed bag podcasting yikes well didn't we learn yeah. about this with uh, dr john brinkley was that his name who like we sure did founded yeah. that whole yeah. radio absolutely thing and was just hawking his his uh f- fake medicine uh, yeah there's to so nothing many people over the radio the it's knew about this is that back in the day you know brinkley was only able to do that because he had a huge amount of money from his goat ball business to establish a radio <laughs> station with mm-hmm. um Aww. now anybody can do this anybody with any really fucking dumb idea can build a whole community dedicated to that dumb idea for whom that dumb idea will become more important than anything else even the lives of their children so oh, that's continue so listening to podcasts and supporting our industry. <laughs> oh no! Oh, it's good stuff. Oh, it's, it's real good stuff. Everything's a nightmare. <laughs> okay. So, on the free birthing podcast, Emily Saldaya hosted the most positive stories of free births. Judith was particularly taken by the tale of one woman who gave birth out in an unpowered yurt in the mountains of California with quote only her husband and a dog. She called her mid. Wolf. Oh no! Oh, that ruins. Dogs are not obstetricians. <laughs> that... They're wonderful animals, but you they 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 cannot help in a birthing. No, that also just ruins puns for the rest of my life. I know, I know, <laughs> I know. And Anderson, I know. Mid-wolf? To this day, I know to this day, the woman who decided <laughs> to call her dog her midwolf, that's the thing she's proudest of, is that bit of wordplay, yeah. and I hate it. Uh, um, midwolf. I can't get mid-wolf. over it. I'm looking at Anderson, and Anderson is shaking her head going, this is not right. <sighs> but this is this is like an aspect of this story. It's like a lot of these women are like off the grid women, women who live on farms and stuff, who are actually like probably really competent in a lot of ways because it's hard to live that way. I oh, have sure. lived that way, and it's incredibly difficult, and it requires an amount of fortitude. And that's probably why women like Judith are able to go weeks past their due date and like the horrible pain that that involves because they're tough people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I there's an extent to it. Like I I fucking hate hospitals. Um, and I avoid them at all goddamn costs. Same. Yes. And I like living yes. out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> and I like not relying on anyone for, you know, things of, of, of my daily necessities. I enjoy that. I understand those impulses. But when you're bringing a baby into the world, 
your personal level of comfort with, you know, all that matters less than the child's survival. I, it just does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's part of being a parent, right? Is that like you put the child first? That's why I don't have a kid. That's why we've been able to perpetuate the species. <laughs> yeah. Is, uh, yeah. Caring for yeah. the young. I know. I put Robert over myself. I pick Robert over myself all the time because he's my son. I, yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> And uh, that's why you've got three bullets in your shoulder. I know. Well, I so know. few. And I, I appreciate sacrifice. you jumping in between me and that California Highway Patrol officer. But that's a story for another day <laughs> and another podcast. Um, so Judith becomes obsessed with these stories of, you know, these women having free births in these like amazing and exotic locales in the woods on top of mountains in foreign countries. Um, and she she like like loves this stuff and listens to it every day and and recalled later to NBC, I became obsessed. I would just wonder, what's my story going to be like? And think, I want my story to be as badass as their stories. So you see, Hmm. like, uh, there's a a level of danger here, too, in the way that online communities do. Everyone pushes each other more extreme. You gave birth in an unpowered yurt? Well, fuck it. I'll give birth in a cave or some shit (laughs) like that. Like, so... Like many Americans, uh, Judith entered into this world with a distrust of doctors. Uh, She'd been put under anesthesia as a child and found the experience frightening. As a college student, a doctor shrugged off her inner ear pain, ignoring what she thought was a real issue. Quote, just calculating all the experiences I've had with doctors, I never felt heard. I never felt listened to. And this is an extremely common complaint from women uh, who give birth in the United States. Very common. A lot of women will tell you, I didn't think the doctor was listening to me. I didn't feel like they cared about my pain or my situation. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's not just in that situation. I mean, listen to Sludge, you guys. Listen to Sludge. Listen to Sludge. The whole, yeah. yeah, like every <laughs> every st- m- part of my story is that, f- yeah. many people's stories, which is why we need such a major overhaul of the Absolutely. American healthcare system, because it is full of a lot of medical professionals yeah. who are, uh, y- you know, Exhibiting certain biases against certain demographics of people, largely women, people of color, queer people, yeah. people with invisible disabilities, plus size people. I mean, so many groups of people yeah. are ignored or their pain isn't believed or anything like that. And uh, it, it, it like I can understand why certain people would be like, yeah, I don't want to deal with yeah. like the healthcare. System, it's completely screwed me over. It's completely neglected me. But I mean, so the I mean, this the root the of way. the problem <laughs> yeah, it, is it, it, this system that is so broken. But and it's you know, a lot of the problem is like, like, like everything you've said is very valid. And I, I would add to that a lot of where these women go wrong is like they recognize that the system's fucked up and it is Mm -hmm. and they say like the problem is then the doctors we need to just not have doctors involved and it's like no 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 a big part of the problem is actually there aren't nearly enough doctors and they're all overworked so Mm -hmm. even like the really good ones and the ones who are capable of like you know transcending those biases are also just like overworked and exhausted and sleep deprived and pissed off a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And maybe they don't give you the best bedside manner because they're they're doing way too much work. And if we had a lot more doctors, not only would you have a wider uh, a variety of life experiences among medical professionals. And so you'd have more doctors who might understand members of these groups, but you would also have less exhausted doctors. And so they'd be able to provide better care. Right. Um there's so many problems with our so, so what perfect we need, system. What we need is for anyone who's considering starting a podcast, don't mm-hmm. do it. There's too many. Become a doctor. And, and become a doctor instead. <laughs> yeah, every single one of you, stop <laughs> listening to our podcast and go to medical school. You know how easy it is to just become yeah. a doctor? Just do that. Look, if you're listening to this podcast where you're putting up drywall for your job as a day laborer, drop that fucking drywall hammer or whatever you use to put up drywall and go become a doctor right now. Right now. This podcast's over. Yeah. (laughs) 
So um, Judith is kind of very primed by her past bad experiences with doctors to distrust doctors in the first place. So when she starts listening to this free birthing podcast and hearing its hosts use terms like industrial obstetric tyranny and birth rape, she was ready to, to graft those words and the idea behind them onto her life. She watched the Free Birth Society's introduction video hosted by instructor Yolanda Norris Clark and the business partner of Emily Saldaya, the host of the Free Birthing podcast. And I want you to listen to how Yolanda introduces herself in this video. Sophie, that's your cue. Oh, that's my cue. <laughs> that's your cue. I'm Yolanda Clark. I'm a writer, a birth consultant, and I'm the director of education with the Free Birth Society. And my passion and mission in life is to share the open secret that birth is not an inherently medical event, but a spontaneous function of biology, and that it is the pregnant woman herself who possesses inalienable authority over her birth process. I woke up to the truth about birth almost 18 years ago, and since then, I've dedicated my life to studying birth and supporting euphoric birth, and I've given birth myself to seven healthy babies in my home without any involvement from medical professionals at all, from conception to emergence. I like how she yeah. includes uh, conception in there. I didn't need a doctor present when I was yeah. fucking. <laughs> <laughs> fucking is easy. It doesn't require a doctor. <laughs> Clearly, childbirth is the same. <laughs> right. Yeah. Look, I don't need a doctor around when I'm shooting off my gun, so why do I need a doctor when I accidentally shoot my son? Mm, yeah, the, these the wild leaps of logic are... Yeah. Ooh, I also... Boy. If you... I, you weren't the guest for our episodes on Keith Raniere and the Nexium cult, but if you go back to the old videos of... um, what, What's her name? That, that lady who was on Smallville? Uh, Allison, Allison Mack. Uh, Allison Mack talking to Keith Raniere... And listen to the cadence of their voices and compare it to the cadence of Yolanda's voice. They all talk the same way Ooh. with the same sort of speech patterns. And I find that very interesting. Well, okay. So <laughs> to quote Hitler, yikes. <laughs> to, qu <laughs> to quote Hitler. <laughs> I mean, you know what? There's a couple of things I'll quote Hitler on in a, a sense of agreeing with him. And one of them is how to convince a bunch of people of something I'm shitty. Only he knew how to do it. He wasn't bad at that. I'm only <laughs> quoting the quote that you already said from Mein Kampf, yeah. but just like the power of the, the human voice, right? So yeah. I, I hope there are people out there. I know that we, we should probably edit this out. But no. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. <laughs> you cannot edit audio. <laughs> you cannot edit a human voice. Um <laughs> So I hope there are enough people out there who can like detect this those like culty like and now la 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 like the the just like the propaganda uh, yeah yeah that whole cadence to pick up on the bullshit that they're spewing and listeners couldn't see but she was doing like this like almost like conductor like hand motion the mm. entire time that was also very flowy and swayy and culty. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think I mean, uh, uh, Robert. Obviously, you picked up on it. Like, I, I just hope that for the people mm -hmm. out there who like listen to all these podcasts out there, and uh, they can like they can tell when people are being scary and mm -hmm. spewing propaganda bullshit. And I hope that they understand that when I tell them. To purchase bolt cutters. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so later in that video, Yolanda warns against inducing labor, calling it an eviction from the womb and basically arguing that it's traumatic to the infant. Uh, she brags about taking her pregnancies well past the normal 40 weeks. In Yolanda's eyes, the idea that the risk of stillbirths rises rapidly after 42 weeks is nonsense. She <laughs> states, babies come out. Babies always come out. <laughs> So, when Judith's pregnancy crept past 42 weeks, she assured herself it was fine by remembering Yolanda's words. She also sought reinforcement from her friends in the freebirthing Facebook group. Things were not fine, of course, and her baby was, in fact, stillborn. The only good news in this terrible story is that this horrific tragedy shocked Judith out of the weird little internet cult she'd gotten drawn into. As she told NBC... 
I think I brainwashed myself with the internet. And I that's what happened. The internet, like, the fact that Judith was capable of realizing this mm-hmm. and acknowledging the bad decisions that, that set her on this path should key you in on the critical fact that she's not a dumb person. She's right. a person who did a dumb thing with a horrible consequence. But she herself is an intelligent, capable, reasonable human being. The internet made her stupid. This doesn't take away from her culpability in the tragedy, and she definitely has quite a lot here. Yeah. But it does highlight a critical reality. Without this massive ecosystem, totaling tens of thousands of people and hundreds of dedicated content creators, Judith would not have been able to convince herself to make these bad decisions. This this just wouldn't have happened in an, right. an age in which this, this internet infrastructure didn't exist. The train of things that led to Judith's stillbirth st- bears tremendous similarities to the radicalization pathway for numerous neo-Nazi and white supremacist terrorists. Some dumb kid comes across a really transgressive podcast or a review of a movie they like by some YouTuber like Stefan Molyneux, and that leads them to other content and eventually a more extreme communities. And after a few months or a few years, you've got yourself a committed white supremacist. And as is the case with all these new Nazis we're dealing with in 2020, mm. there are specific individuals to blame for creating the radicalization pathways in the free birthing community. The internet may have made Judith stupid, but it didn't do so on its own. And the two people most responsible for the spread of the free birthing movement and its modern deadly dimensions are Emily Saldaya and Yolanda Norris Clark. They wind up in every single one of these stories. Take the case of Lisa, a 29-year-old Californian who talked to the Daily Beast. Lisa had been living off the grid in an eco-friendly sort of, you know, situation in the middle of nowhere when she found a freebirthing page on Instagram. The idea immediately appealed to her, and she joined the freebirthing Facebook group that Emily Saldaya ran. Like Judith, she kept her new friends up to date with her pregnancy. Quote, Been in labor for days. Thought I was in transition at 11.30 p.m., but now it's 3 a.m. and it's intensely painful. Like I just want to lie down and for the pain to stop for a second. Saldaya reached out to her via Facebook Messenger to give support. Other group members left comments like, You're a legend. It will happen. Like Justine, Lisa's pregnancy went on for far too long. Her baby was also born dead. She made a quick post to the Free Birth Society's Facebook group, and people there sympathized with her. But the important work of radicalizing other pregnant women to avoid hospitals and even midwives continued, or at least it would have, if not for what happened next. And I'm going to quote from the Daily Beast again here. A group of concerned outsiders, worried the free birthers were being reckless, had set up fake sock puppet accounts to gain entry to the private group and monitor its members. The interlopers saw themselves as sentries, keeping watch over alternative lifestyle practitioners they believed were putting their babies in harm. The sock puppets took screenshots of Lisa's comments and posted them in their own groups, sparking instant outcry from their followers. Some of them marveled at why anyone would take such a risk with a pregnancy, while others blamed Saldaya for luring impressionable women into a dangerous practice. Others were more vicious. The twat from the Free Birth Society needs drop kicking out of a fucking window, one person wrote. I wouldn't mind seeing this monster swinging from a light post, added another. So that's all the internet that you and I know and love, Mm -hmm. uh, Caitlin. Yes. Um, Yeah. These eruptions of death threats and outrage by anti-freebirthing activists came to follow every new dead baby story. When baby Journey Moon died in 2018, uh, the weight of attention and outrage leveled against the Free Birth Society caused Emily Saldaya to close all four of her Facebook groups. And here's what she wrote in the post announcing this. And, oh boy, strap in for this one, Caitlin. Oh, okay. Dear community, it is with a heavy heart that we officially announce the closing of our four wonderful groups here on Facebook. As of November 1st, all members will be removed and the groups closed permanently. As many of you know, a member of our private Free Birth Society group tragically lost her baby during the birth process earlier this year. The painful reality is that babies do sometimes die in all settings, including the hospital, and every pregnant woman must contend with the possibility of death, which exists for each of us. Babies just die. Uh, Emily went on to complain about her own death threats, uh, the ones that she'd received from anti-freebirthing activists, and closed the post by announcing, In light of all this, we at Freebirth Society are advancing our plan to move off Facebook to a safe and private membership platform. Hmm. Patreon. No. <laughs> yeah, that's actually exactly what they're doing. It's not Patreon, but that's the exactly the goal. Yeah. This is a grift. Um, the private membership platform is not free. It costs $108 to be a member. Wow. And since her Facebook group had more than 6,000 members when she closed it down, the amount of money, or 46,000 members when she closed it down, the amount of money on the line here is potentially significant. And that's not the whole of the grift. It's barely the start. 
Emily and Yolanda run a website, freebirthsociety.com. On it, you can buy a coffee table book, She Rises, an annual edition of The Wild Mother, which is another thing these people call themselves, for just $29.99. You can also pay for a number of different cool services, Caitlin. You're going to love hearing about this. There's the Lighthouse Leaders Group Coaching Series from $175, Birth Trauma Debrief for $150, Radical Birth Keeper Consultation for $100, Self Mastery Coaching for $150, and Undisturbed Birth Education and Prep for $150. Now, I bet you're wondering, what is what is Radical Birth Keeper Consultation? I am wondering that. Please tell me. So I looked into it. <laughs> And it turns out it's a guide for other women to start their own business in the radical birth work field. How is there a market for that? (laughs) Well, because these ladies are making bank. Emily and fucking Yolanda are making a ton. Who wouldn't want to make money off of this? Uh... It's like making a money as a midwife, but with all all of that pasky training and apprenticeship and learning useful medical shit. Mm. (laughs) Oh, good God. Here's a a quote from the... um, the page for that that thing. New to birth work? Not sure where to start? Or maybe you've been attending births for a while and are feeling sick. If you're called to radical birth work, identified by us as standing with and for women, we are here to help you brainstorm business ideas and dive into all things birth work. We have effectively coached many women who want to launch their birth businesses but don't know where to start or feel stymied by the pressures that they perceive from general social climate around birth or worry as to what and how to charge for their services. During the session, we will help you cut through the noise of self-judgment and help you clarify your birth work superpower and project your vision to the world, implement your passion, and translate it into working with women with the highest integrity. This is a 60-minute session that will be done over FaceTime or Zoom. (laughs) Okay, so (laughs) let me me understand this. So they are basically, they offer this service where you can consult with someone to learn how to be a person who will be present at... B- free births yep. just to like help out in case anything goes wrong. So they mm-hmm. acknowledge the need for yeah. people to be there. Just not people just with actual medical Medical experience. training. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. It, okay. Th- this is kind of where I, I start to see it as to- like, I don't think like Justine, obviously one of the, the one we've talked about the most, like there was no grift for her. She just thought this was the best thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was wrong, but these women, Yolanda, uh, Emily Saldaya and Yolanda Norris Clark, um, these are people who just want the respect and money that a real professional like a midwife or a doctor receives uh, mm-hmm. as a result of what they do. But they don't want to take any training or get any kind of license or be told by anyone that whatever crazy ideas they have about birth are, aren't are like right. Mm-hmm. So they've just built up this community where they're treated like real medical professionals and essentially train other people in how to give birth without actually knowing how to train other people <laughs> to give birth. Train people then, how to Help yeah. give birth with no train, like train people to not be trained. <laughs> like, yeah, it's mind boggling. It's incredible. And if you decide, Caitlin, that you want comprehensive coaching on how to free birth your own baby, Emily and Yolanda will be more than happy to help you for a price. Their full coaching package is a bargain at just $899. Oh, my <laughs> God. Oh, fuck yeah. Well, I have now, decided that I want their help, so I'm going to start saving mm-hmm. up. <laughs> oh yeah, midwives goodness. have to, like, go to a place. You just give it on Skype, baby. That's mm. the way easier. Oh, my God. Now... I I can't say for certain that Lisa, one of the mothers whose baby died, uh, was actively paying Yolanda and Emily for birth coaching. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she mentions getting Facebook messages from Saldaya makes me think that she was. Uh, And the precise wording of how the Daily Beast discussed this is suspicious to me. Quote, Saldaya says she provided no advice to Lisa and never even spoke to her on the phone. Which doesn't mean she didn't get on Skype or Zoom or something. Okay, so a different medium maybe then Mm -hmm. yeah maybe Hmm. I found Yolanda Norris Clark on Facebook and Instagram she goes by Bauhaus wife and sends out free birthing memes and updates to her combined 12,000 followers here's one example 
The idea that governments could ever have the legitimate jurisdiction to designate birth workers or license birth work in any capacity should be preposterous and outrageous to everyone. The fact that it isn't, and that so many women especially have accepted and even welcomed the appropriation of midwifery by the patriarchal false authority of the official institutions, just reinforces the task that we have at hand <laughs> to rewild and reauthenticate our relationship to ourselves, to motherhood, to our bodies, to our children, and to each other. Hashtag radical birth keeper, hashtag radical birth work, hashtag Bauhaus wife, hashtag free birth, hashtag home birth, hashtag wild birth, hashtag free birth society, hashtag free birth society, radical birth keeper school, hashtag radical birth keeper school, hashtag free birth society. <laughs> Okay, so these are like the the turfs of yeah. the birthing yeah, community. Yeah, They're yeah like, these are birth turfs. Yeah, birth mm-hmm. turfs. They're like, you were so right before when you said they were like co-opting certain like language in terms yeah. of like pro-choice language and that but then they've just like taken it to this such this yeah. horribly harmful radical yikes. Yeah, I she has her own branded memes. It. One of them reads, governments have no business in birth. Birth belongs to women. Which... Like, sh- yeah, is, but not yeah. when your baby dies because you, like, yeah. ignore science. Yeah, the baby has some rights, too, uh, at the point at which it's coming out. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, oh, yikes. Uh, the ki- this kind of language is powerfully effective to the women who wind up in these groups. Uh, studies have been done on the free birthing community in the U.S. and Australia, and four key things come up over and over again when women say how they found this community. And I'm quoting from a paper commissioned by Evidence-Based Midwifery. So this is an, a midwives-like organization. Mm-hmm. Rejection of the medical and midwifery models of birth, faith in the birth process, autonomy and agency. There was a prevailing sense of choosing to free birth in order to retain choice, control, and autonomy over their bodies during the birth process. It's about control. Mm -hmm. Another analysis I found on the conversation backs up this interpretation. Quote, where home birth services were available, some women did not want the routine care that is provided by midwives. This was largely due to the belief that routine care practices would cause interference that would get in the way of their ability to birth safely. Additionally, they were concerned that they may face coercion should they decline aspects of care provided by the midwives. Therefore, they did not want care imposed upon them during childbirth. The researchers' findings across all studies agreed that women ought to retain full control and autonomy throughout their experience of giving birth, a need they felt maternity services were unable to meet. Hmm. Yeah. Because you can't, you don't, you can't. It's not, you don't own the baby once it's coming out. It's not your property. It's yeah. a, 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 a thing. It's like, it's leaving. It's 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 getting on out of there. It has, it, <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just you hate you hate to see it where you they're hate like to see it. they're like yes women's autonomy yeah. and agency and absolutely because like these are things I so strongly agree with and they're but they're oh they've just Incredibly taken it to important. this horrible horrible place oh they really no. do like it, it it rules like I don't enjoy getting a pap smear Mm-mm. but I'm not no. gonna do it to myself because I don't fucking know how <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, I have given myself a pap smear, but I don't know what a pap smear is. So I, I just kind of, you know, Robert, may I explain to you what a pap smear is? <laughs> I think that the, the reality of that situation, Caitlin, is between me and my hammer. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm good I'll at let it, you. Though. I'll let you look it up. I'm pretty sure I'm good at it. It's unpleasant to say the least. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting the self schmear community, actually. Um, oh, the online. free free schmearing, free smears. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people say men cannot get and give themselves pap smears using hammers, but my Facebook group says otherwise. Uh, well, as long as mm-hmm. um, babies are not dying, I guess mm-hmm. that's that's what's important here. No, no babies dying. Some some people. <laughs> Some people um, are doing some adults. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, the sad reality is that more and more babies are going to keep dying as a result of the free birthing movement. Emily Saldaya and Yolanda Norris Clark will continue podcasting and memeing and making bank while America's infant mortality rate ticks ever higher. The NBC article that came out earlier this year helped to highlight the movement, but in the end, it may just draw more women into the movement's maw. That's certainly what Emily Saldaya thinks. In the immediate wake of the NBC article, which was focused around the death of a child from someone who followed Emily's instructions to a T, she posted this on Instagram. 
Hey guys, no podcast this week. Decided to prioritize self-care and create some spaciousness to relax and be fully present with my baby after an insane month of working my ass off on this membership launch. I'm extremely proud of what we've built and it feels so good to be off Facebook. Thank you for the outpouring of love and support I've re- received in this hard as fuck past six weeks. Someday when I'm ready, I will talk at length about my experience on this full-on cyber attack, but for now, it's only furthered my resolve in this work. Truth and light will always shine brighter and carry more endurance. And in the words of Lena Dunham, no one that actually knows me thinks I'm an asshole, and that's what matters. When you know and love who you are, you're unshakable. The bright side of all this weird media attention is it's brought a ton of women to this movement, so fuck yes to transmuting people's traumatized shit energy into something powerful and exciting. Big uh, bicep uh, emoticon, fist emoticon. And to all the haters out here that have gotten weirdly obsessed with me, I still got all the love in my heart for you, and I will keep fighting for you, whether you're with me or not. Fire emoticon, heart emoticon, heart emoticon, heart emoticon, heart emoticon, heart emoticon. Hashtag free birth society. Hashtag the free birth podcast. Hashtag haters gonna hate strong women. Hashtag Hashtag smash the patriarchy. Hashtag calling bullshit. Hashtag light wins. Hashtag I am not afraid. Hashtag strong as fuck. Hashtag Lena Dunham, you inspire me. Hashtag bye bye Facebook. Lena Dunham, you inspire (laughs) me. (laughs) (laughs) Women are taking advice on their baby's health care from this person. (laughs) That's so scary. Also, if I like if I if it like (laughs) Okay. If I I can't even speak. Um, it's amazing. It's I'm fucking so astonishing. Flabbergasted. Yeah. I think yeah. if I if like if my feminism ever inspired like free birthers to be like yeah smash the patriarchy I will I don't know what I will do I will have to just like yeah. log off and never be present in the world again like if my yes. message somehow gets convoluted to like this version of scary radical free birth feminism Ugh. horrifying yeah yeah you don't have to give birth in a hospital but you do have to consult medical professionals about your birth to do so responsibly yeah because uh, when you decide you're bringing a baby into the world it's not all about you anymore mm-hmm. um but it is all about you when you're performing a home pap smear as a man and that's why you should join my facebook group man smearing <laughs> Where we're teaching each other how to recapture pap smearing from the medical industrial establishment and the feminist establishment and remail and rewild pap smears for all of the men who have access to Home Depot hammers. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that. Caitlin? <laughs> um, I will say this. If... What wouldn't it be funny if there were like MRAs out there who were like, um, men should be able to get pap smears too, <laughs> and then mm-hmm. and then they like go out and buy a speculum or sorry a, a hammer and uh, a hammer. Yes, <laughs> the male pap smear is performed with a hammer. Yeah. I see. <laughs> um. Well, I just. <laughs> I just keep you feeling going, good, Caitlin. <laughs> I feel great. I just I keep going back to like. One of the roots of the problem that uh, f- that births the free birth movement, see what I did there, midwolf, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. Um, is the broken American healthcare system. And if we totally just shattered, find a way to f- fix that. Uh, I I feel like th- there would there would never be a, a need of any any you know mothers to feel the need to have a free birthing experience. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, I mean, we, gosh, <laughs> I, just, I feel sick. <laughs> well, if you're feeling sick, that means it's the perfect time to plug your pluggables because nothing <laughs> cures your ailments like a solid plug. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll start with Sludge, an American healthcare story. Uh, my podcast about uh, my experience finding out that I had gallstones and the very long and arduous process that it took for me to get surgery to get them taken out. Uh, so check out that. And I It's keep, amazing. Thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, I keep um, saying, yeah, I'm releasing season two soon. And I don't know when that's going to happen, but uh, it'll happen someday. But season two focuses on other people's uh, medical nightmare stories. Excellent. Um, so. <laughs> uh, We're big fans of medical nightmares here. Yeah. So. I mean, I'm excited. I, I want, I, 
I should really have my mom on. Want, I will. Sure. Yeah. I'll have anyone on. If anyone has a medical, that's the other thing. Mm-hmm. If people have medical yeah. horror stories, um, please email them to me at sludgestorypodcast at gmail.com. Um, I'll probably feature them on the podcast again when I start releasing episodes someday. Um, yeah. I just, I want to have faith in a healthcare system. Um, it just needs to be very much revamped. So, um, yeah, let's work on that society. Anyway, um, you can listen to my less of a bummer podcast, The Bechtel Cast, which is also still kind of a bummer sometimes because <laughs> it's all about how um, mo- most movies are horrible to women. Um, so, you know, <laughs> sometimes they're not, though, and those episodes are nice. Um, and then you can follow me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Caitlin Durante. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's that's about it. Yay. And you can find me on the internet at manschmearing.com <laughs> and the Manschmearing Facebook group where we talk about how to reclaim our wherever you s- do that uh, from doctors and the, the, the feminatriarchy. Um, that's that's it, the end of the episode. So what Robert meant to say is he's at I write okay on Twitter. We're at Bastard Spot on Twitter and Instagram. We have a T public store. Robert also hosts Worst Year Ever. Uh, I yep. have Twitter. Yes, Sophie has plug a Twitter. your Twitter. I've, I've actually Follow never. Sophie. I've actually never said it out loud. <gasps> it's Y underscore Sophie underscore Y Anderson content. That's it. Okay, so why Sophie? Why why under okay? And then Caitlin, want to do it for me because you're a professional. Okay, so follow Sophie <laughs> Ray Lichterman at on Twitter at y underscore Sophie underscore y, and then it features Anderson content. I thought the whole handle for a second was that. See, I'm Excellent. not a professional like you. I'm a hack and a fraud. No, you're All not. Right, that's the fucking that's episode. That's the fucking episode. <laughs>